I believe it's important that as we come to church and we worship together, that we are edified in the Word of God together. So we can't do this life alone. We need the church, amen? And I, I am so refreshed coming to church. I'm glad we get to do this thing together. This morning, we're going to turn to Ephesians chapter 4. I'll be reading out of the English Standard Version. If you're new to the Bible, this is the place for you to be. You are more than welcome here to ask questions and dig deeper in the Bible and understand it more. We're here to help. We also believe that the Holy Spirit shows us what we need to know as we read it. So uh, pray and ask God to reveal His Word to your heart because as you open up your heart, and this is what I found to be true, as you open up your heart, God will show you amazing things in His Word. And we're also here to help you with your questions about it as well. Today we're talking about unity in the body of Christ. Unity, such a sore topic in today's society, am I right? Such a sore topic. There's opinions that people have about many different things in the world and everywhere. And so we're going to take a look at Ephesians chapter 4, and we're going to read the whole chapter this morning. So it's a lot to munch on, but here we go. We're going to jump in Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 1. And this is what it says. If you're following along in your Bibles this morning, it's not on the screen. My apologies, but I want us to see it right from the pages of the Word today. Here's what it says. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit. Just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he also descended into the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children, tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into Him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learned Christ, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him, as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. And this is a good part, amen, to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as in Christ God forgave you. Would you join me in prayer? Dear Jesus, we need you to reveal your word to us. We can't understand it in our own minds. We need your spirit to inspire us as we read this today and we understand what you have to say to us. 
We pray this in Jesus' name. And the church said, Amen. Amen. Verse 3 in Ephesians 4 says, Eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. See, we as Christians should be doing our part to what we can do to promote peace. We shouldn't be people who... We shouldn't just be people who seek unity in our world, but also in our workplaces, and yes, in this very church. And you might say, well, but so-and-so rubs me the wrong way. Or, that person isn't doing what I want them to do, and you know, the list goes on and on. And I hear what you're saying, and there's some people in life that bother me too, but I want to remind you of something today. There will always be people who view things differently than you do. It's truly inevitable, no matter where you go. In my educational background, I have a bachelor's degree in Bible and theology, but in high school, I took an advanced music theory course that really brought a lot of things to light to me. When I was growing up, I learned, and I have people ask me every once in a while, did you learn piano through piano lessons? Did you learn saxophone or guitar through lessons? Um, a, a little bit of that was playing by ear with piano, as piano especially. Um, but when I took this music course, it taught me why different things are the way they are as far as music. For instance, I would be going through the music theory course, they'd be talking about a topic, and I'd say, man, that doesn't look familiar. And then they would explain it and say, oh yeah, okay, that makes sense. So when I do this on the piano, it explains what you know, this topic and this term is talking about. And so I took in this course, it brought a lot of things to light. My mind lives and breathes music, and I really can't get it out of my head. Even sometimes if I wanted to. And I'll tell you that we went so deep into music theory in this class that it ruined classical music for me. Here's why. One of our tests was to listen to classical music and write out what's happening in every single measure. Every note that moves, what does it mean? What is the interval between each note? Why did it move there? This is a key change. How does that work? And it really, in part, ruined uh, classical music for me. But that's beside the point. Regardless, we're going to talk about a term today called musical dissonance. And in fact, the word dissonance is defined by Oxford Oxford Dictionary as so, a lack of harmony among musical notes, or a tension of clash resulting from the combination of two disharmonious or unsuitable elements. Let me show you what this is. This is going to be fun. I can't wait. I hope you're with me this morning. So as we play a note on the piano, let's just say we're playing a G. So that sounds nice, right? We've got one note... And that sounds good. But then if we add something else in there, that, my friends, is called dissonance. And it's not the most pretty thing you've ever heard. This is also dissonance. (laughs) Awful, okay? It's all dissonance. Anything that is not going with one another. A lack of harmony. Now, if we are looking at harmony, that is beautiful harmony. But if we do not have harmony, it's a few notes that are are going with each other, and that's not good, right? So we have these two notes. kind of sounds like a train is coming. Am I right? Sounds like the train tracks. But if we take these awful notes that don't sound very good together, and we add some other notes that actually do sound good together, and mind you, I'm going to be playing these two notes all the way up and down the piano for just a moment. If you add other notes you will take what was bad and make it sound good. I'm still playing those two notes that were clashing with each other, but there's enough going on around it to make it not even hardly noticeable. In your relationships with others, are you the dissonant notes or are you the unity notes? Are you, this, are you providing the dissonance? And I hope not. Are we providing the dissonance or not? Because we can make a beautiful chord out of something that is not good. Like I say, we are always going to have people or things that rub us the wrong way. But sometimes we can choose to be part of the beautiful chord, even though we're always going to have this dissonance among us. Paul encourages us to be eager or desire very much to be a part of unity in the spirit, in the bond of peace. We're bonded together with peace. And as we bond together, let's be part of peace. In music, dissonance can be part of what you're doing on the piano or other instruments, but if you play enough correct notes around it, it blends in, and you can truly make a beautiful sound with enough correct notes. And so, what role are you playing? What role are you playing in the musical piece of life? Oh, that's pretty cliche, I know, but what role are you playing? Think about that. 
this morning. I recently heard a pastor named Jefferson Jones this last week talk about how the enemy is trying to get in between believers using different hot topics of today. And Ephesians 6 talks about this idea that our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but our struggle is that the enemy is trying to come in between us. Right? We understand this topic. If we're at war with one another, we really are not at war with them like we think. It's really the enemy trying to get in between us and split us apart. We know it's the devil that is causing these issues because the devil is the author of confusion. And right now in 2021, people war against each other with the idea of being pro-vaccine or anti-vaccine for the COVID shot. In 2020, one group wanted church doors to close because of COVID-19 and one group wanted church doors to open. This caused division in churches all over our world. In 2019, President Trump pushed for the funding of the wall on the border, and people fought over this. In 2018, the U.S. had a government shutdown, and it all stemmed from a disunity about how to fund operations of the federal government. In 2017, there were protests revolving around NFL players kneeling during the national anthem. In 2016, the disunity was Trump supporters against Clinton supporters, and the question over the influence of other countries involved in the, erect, in, in the election results there were fights, there were brawls, there were riots over this. Church, we have to understand that I have seen the devil's schemes long enough to know what looks like division and confusion, and I've seen it over the last many years in what he's doing in this world. And it is time for the church of Jesus Christ to stand up and link arms and be the driving force for unity as the church as a whole. No more fighting, no more entertaining, trying to Get everyone to know what your side is on an issue. Let's link arms, realizing that people will believe differently than you do. And unless they're inherently opposing Scripture, we can still accept that others might believe something a little bit different than we do on a given topic. Romans 12, verses 2 through 4 says, One person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains. And let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. In the same way, church, one person believes this about the vaccine and another believes another thing about whatever, let them believe what they're going to believe because their decision's not on your head. Okay, one person believes this way about politics and the other believes another thing and maybe someone is believing something completely unscriptural and they're going down an awful path. Pray for them. Don't browbeat them with your way of thinking. It's not the route to go because I have not heard one person say in my lifetime, man, when I was living in sin, someone posted a comment on my social media page and I just thought, wow, they're right. I need to give my heart to Jesus now. I've never heard anybody say that. I've also not heard anyone say, well, you know what? I got saved because someone told me how bad of a sinner I was and how I won't ever amount to anything. And then they listed 10 scripture verses about how I'm wrong. Jesus does the saving. We're called to be a light to the world, not a nuisance. We're called to be people who live by the fruit of the Spirit out of Galatians 5, not the fruit of destruction. We're called to let the words of our mouth be pleasing, Psalm 19, not letting the words of our mouth be a stench to all who hear. We're supposed to let the word of God be sharper than any double-edged sword, not allowing our words to try and be that double-edged sword. Whew, these are strong words. These are strong words today, church, but it's so important that we understand that we have a call to unity in the body of Christ. And if we choose to stay in our mode of thinking, to trying to get everyone else to believe what we want them to believe, we're not representing Christ in the way that we ought to. Colossians 3 verse 17 says, And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Wow. If we truly let this sink in, doing everything in the name of Jesus. One translation, the New Living Translation, specifically says, do everything as a representative of Jesus Christ. As a representative of Jesus Christ. We're representing Christ. It's a hefty job. It really is. And it's a big responsibility, so don't sacrifice your responsibility over 
an opinion that could have stayed in your mind and not have come out of your mouth. And you might say, come on now, I understand what you're saying, do your best to live at peace with people and everything, I get that. But what if someone is completely living in sin? What if we know, based on everything we understand from Scripture, that someone is living completely in sin? What do we do then? Now, there's times, church, that we have people in our lives that are not living their lives according to Scripture. And we have to then find a way to approach them. And the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, has a great way to approach this. Verse 15 says, Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ. Two key words we find in this. One is the word truth. The second is the word love. First of all, there's simply truth in God's word that's undeniable, right? There's some major truths. Murder is sin, gossip is sin, and so on. Those are truths. There's also some truth about how God is with us and how he'll never leave us. Those are also truths that we find in God's word. This scripture is talking about speaking the truth, yes, because the truth is important, but verse 15 says to speak the truth in love. See, church, love is the driving factor here in speaking the truth. We speak truth with the motivation of love. We don't speak truth with the motivation of trying to look better than the person who's in the wrong, right? We don't speak truth with the motivation of trying to make the other person look bad. We don't speak truth because we don't like the other person anyways, and now they've done something wrong, and now I'm going to use this as an opportunity to shove this down their throat and all this stuff and make them look bad. Jesus, help us. Jesus, help us. Reveal your word to us. We need your help. Let's look into Galatians 6, verse 1. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Interesting here. It's another one of Paul's writings, another verse about speaking the truth and restoring a person in sin. Now, talking about the spirit of gentleness. Gentleness. The other verse said love, and now we're talking about gentleness. Now, with the addition of the admonition to keep watch over yourself, that you are not tempted yourself. Well, you might say, well, that person's struggling with a sin, and I don't struggle with that, so I'll be fine if I call them out in their sin. But, whoa now, let's hold up, because this verse doesn't say that you have to struggle with the same sin. It just says to keep watch that you're not also tempted. Maybe when you're working to restore somebody, you want to gossip about what you've heard about them. Watch yourself. Watch yourself. In college, I, I recall approaching someone on their sin because it was getting out of hand. And we had a strong enough relationship that I could do that with this person. So I did. And when I did that, would you believe that they began to attack me with wrongful accusations? Has that ever happened to you? Right? It happens. So I approached this person, and when they came with the wrongful accusations, I came back with, out of love, I really believe in my heart it was love. Matthew 7, 3 that says, Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but you do not notice the log that is in your own eye? And at the moment, you know, it was kind of fun to send that scripture. Now it's kind of me confessing here. It was kind of fun to send that scripture. But at the same time, in my heart, I said, They're accusing me wrongful accusations. What do I do with that? And I thought, I'm going to use scripture because the Bible is sharper than any double-edged sword. And so I wanted to use Scripture, and so I responded with the Word of God, and when I did this, they had no response. They had no response back because the Word of God was used. They couldn't refute the Word of God. There's power in the Word of God. There's power in the Word of God. I believe that because I didn't respond in anger or outrage, and I did not, I took what the accusations were, I knew they weren't true, so I responded with, hey, let's take a look at this. Matthew 7, 3, why do you see the speck in your brother's eye and don't notice the log in your own eye? The Bible is powerful. It's sharper than any double-edged sword. There is so much more in this chapter I want to cover, but for the sake of time, let's skip to this admonition in verse 29. It says, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up 
as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. So church, above all else, don't let corrupt talk come out of your mouth. Do you have anger against a brother or sister or an opinion against something or someone else? Have you been offended because you can't get it out of your mind? I've been there. I've been there. Hash it out with God in prayer. Hash it out with God in prayer. He can handle it, by the way. He can handle it. Because you may be the one that needs to change your perspective. And as we pray about it, after we've done that, if you believe in your heart that you're right with God, then pray about how you're going to approach this other person that you believe has done wrong. Because remember, with love and gentleness in mind, we have to have love and gentleness throughout this entire journey because if it's not, then it's out of hatred. It's out of anger. It's out of spite. I remember a while back, Hannah and I had noticed on a given day that at about halfway between the day, halfway through the day, we had been kind of frustrated at each other. How many of you know that happens sometimes in relationships, and marriage, right? So Hannah and I had a hard day, okay? How many of you know that sometimes in relationships, there's some days that are harder than others and little things can get to us? Little things for getting to each of us on this day. Well, this was one of those days for Hannah and I, and eventually I, trying to be the one to save the day and come in and fix it, I said, you know, Hannah, I just think we need to pause and pray because the enemy's really trying to get in between our relationship. And she said, yep, you're right. And your attitude today has really helped the devil in his schemes. <laughs> Woo! Man! It was hard to take in the moment, as you can imagine. But as I was so surprised, because I couldn't believe she said that, I just had to laugh. I'm like, you know what? You're right, okay? You're right. My attitude's not the greatest today, and I have to just figure it out, right? And so that's how it went down. But she said what she said out of love, and I know she did, because she knew what would help me in the moment. And it did. She did say it out of love, I know. I'm convincing myself every moment. One thing, though, that I absolutely love about my wife, Hannah, and one of the greatest things that I believe we have the ability to do, it's only by the grace of Jesus that we're uh, able to do this, is that we have the ability to reset in a given day, no matter how difficult the day has been. We do this here and there. You know, she'll turn to me and say, you know what? Today's been a little rough. Uh, you think we can just forgive each other and start over? Because what that does I mean, we then don't have to explain why I said something snarky in the morning. She doesn't have to explain why this, that, or the other thing. We don't have to go through any of it because we just cover it and say, all right, I forgive you. Yep, we both said things that weren't good today, and I forgive you. And so she'll say, you know, today's been a little rough. You think we can just forgive each other and start over? And I'll agree and say, hi, my name's Dustin. You're really pretty. Do you want to go on a date? You know, do you want to... We'll go out and get some food. You know, it's funny to think about, but as Hannah and I look back to our dating days... It reminds us of the reason that we started dating each other in the first place. When we have that reset type day, when we're getting all upset at each other and we're able to just say, you know what, let's just reset. Let's start over. Let's start all the way over. Let's remember why we started dating and why we started dating in the first place. And that was because we loved each other. And we believe that God put us together for a special purpose. And as we have difficult days with those around us in life, We've got to remember that we won't always get along or agree with others. But if love is at the forefront of our minds, we will be more apt to be a conduit of peace rather than a conduit of anger and rage. We need to be eager to maintain the spirit of unity with those around us. It's not easy at times. I, I know. It's not easy. But God gives us this admonition throughout much of Scripture. And it's important that we pay attention to this very strongly. Verses 31 and 32, finishing up this chapter 4, it says, let all, ang let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Aren't you grateful for when Christ forgave you? I am forever grateful for how Christ forgave me. And when we look at a scripture like this, it helps me to remember that, yeah, so-and-so said something to me that really hurt me. 
But I also lived my life apart from Jesus for a season. And He still redeemed me. Wow. And He still restored me. And I need to give that same forgiveness and love to others, even though they don't deserve it. And others give me this same forgiveness that I don't deserve because I know I, I messed up. It's so important that we understand this today. If you're dealing with a difficulty in a relationship with someone else, we're going to take a moment to pray. And in a few moments, I'm, I'm going to give you the opportunity to come forward and receive prayer for relationships with others today. But first, I want to mention the most important relationship of all of a relationship with Jesus Christ, the Son of God. If we could get some soft music just playing in the background today, that would be so helpful. Thank you guys up there in the booth. Each of us have sinned and fallen short of God's glory, but God paved a way for us to be cleansed of our wrongdoings. We truly believe. God sent His Son Jesus to make way for us to be saved. And Titus 3, verses 5 through 6 says, He saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. This morning, I'm going to ask anyone who's with us today that wants to make a first-time commitment to Jesus or a recommitment to Jesus Christ to simply stand up from your seat today. This is a moment of a lifetime as you make this decision to accept Christ, if you felt broken, if you felt separated, if you have felt like you're in need of a cleansing today and you want to accept Christ in your heart, I invite you simply to stand up from where you are today and we'll pray as a church together if there's anybody that wants to make this decision this morning. You can make that decision right now in this moment. Amen. Amen. Moving forward this morning, uh, since nobody stood up and that's okay. We're not forcing or pressing the issue, but we do want to encourage you that if you do not know Christ as your Savior and you're thinking about this and you're really mulling this over in your mind, we want to have a conversation with you if, if you'd like to answer any questions that you might have about the Word of God, any questions about salvation. We, we truly want to be a part of that. We believe that's the biggest and most important decision that you can make. And now... As we close, if you've been dealing with a difficulty in a relationship and you need God's help in restoring that and you need to seek peace, I invite you to come forward this morning for prayer. Spend time at the altars this morning. Could I just have everybody stand up as we close today? If you desire to pray with someone that you see up here today, you're welcome to do that. But if that's you and you feel like you've just got, a, you know, need restoration in a relationship with somebody, this is your opportunity to come forward. Seek Jesus for the restoration and the peace today. Seek Jesus. This is your opportunity. If you want, you're welcome to come forward as you seek that peace from the Lord and the Lord only. This is your time if you want to move. This is your time if you want to move. If you need to seek restoration, if you need to seek that unity, and you want to be a part of that, you're welcome to come forward today. If there's any other needs that you are dealing with in your life, please don't let this one call of restoration hold you back from coming out forward this morning and receiving prayer. We believe that God's up to something. God's up to something really, really good. We want to be a part of what God's doing this morning. We want to be a part of what God's doing this morning. Once again, if you need to seek that peace, we invite you to come forward this morning and we're going to pray. I pray, Lord, for those that have come forward and those maybe that are in their seats that are praying about this topic at their seats this morning that you would help them to be the avenue in which peace comes in that relationship. Unity. Unity. We speak unity. We get rid of all anger. We get rid of all rage. We get rid of all malice all of it gone in the name of Jesus as we trust you for the answer. This is your day, Lord. God, as we go, I pray that you would help us. I pray that you would help us to seek you every day. I pray that we would connect with you on a daily basis as we're going throughout our week. I pray that we would be the hands of feet in Jesus as we go out into our workplaces, into the community, back to our families. God, I pray that we would trust you for everything that comes our way. 
God, for any other need that's in this place today, any other need that anyone has come in with, I pray that they offer it to you and trust you for the outcome. That it may not be answered in the timing that we want and sometimes we feel that it's unfair, but God, we trust you today. That your timing is perfect and your will is best. We offer our will up to you and say, Lord, replace it with your will. Replace it with your will. God, be with us as we go. We pray this in Jesus' mighty and powerful name. And the church said, Amen. Amen.